Good day to you all. I'm Megan Williams, a research lead and assistant director at the National Centre for Cultural Competence at the University of Sydney. I'm also with the Sydney Institute of Criminology and Crokey Health Media. I'm Wiradjuri through my dad's family and have worked for a long time mainly on evaluation of criminal justice research uh, projects. So welcome to you all. We're just getting started. Always oh, so grateful to have Cornell and Wendy with us today. I might just, um, if I can, put my phone on Do Not Disturb, I suppose. Sure, yeah. Okay. I've got a long try to do while we all get comfortable. Yeah. It all. I acknowledge that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are the first and ongoing owners of the lands and waters on which we are all most of us in Australia today. On behalf of us all, I acknowledge the ancestors who have exchanged knowledges for thousands of generations for benefits for us all. And I acknowledge the current generations of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and pay my respects to the work that they do. And I think of the large and growing young population of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and the deadly future we can have and that we must all work hard for them because they will take care of all of us one day. So I'm coming to you from the land of the Gadigal. I'm in Enmore in Sydney and I'm very attached to my country, which is around Mudgee. So I know we've got people zooming in from all over the place. So welcome to you all. And it's our honor and privilege to have Cornell and Wendy with us today. And we'll um, ask a little bit of them soon, but firstly, just to acknowledge Cornell belongs to our team at National Centre for Cultural Competence. So we're especially proud of him, the work that he contributes um, in our daily work lives. But we acknowledge that he's the director and writer of this documentary. He's a cinematographer, he's a connector, and he also is somebody that works hard in family and community. So we're very grateful, Mandengu. Thank you so much, Cornell, for bringing this to our lives. So we're here to discuss our law, the documentary, your experience as Aboriginal police officers and community members, as well as our shared visions for socially just lives and respecting diversity among Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people. We're blown away by the incredible amount of attention in the media to policing recently, to deaths in custody, that Black Lives Matter. We're desperate for solutions that we can advocate for and you provide us with an example of something valuable that's really important for us to think hard about. So in that sense, thanks for your contributions. And I ask all in attendance today to honour our all of our rights to be respected here for this to be a safe space for all of us and a, a safe discussion for us to bring good spirit here today. And we hope that you as our guests really enjoy your time with us and that we can all just relax. So this session's being recorded. Don't let that scare you. Those of you who said um, when you registered that you wanna receive further updates, uh, you'll get a message saying, when and where the video is available. And it'll also be available through our university Yammer site, but feel free to get in touch with us directly at the National Centre for Cultural Competence if you want to follow up in any way. So we've got a Q&A function here on Zoom. So if you have questions to ask of Cornell and Wendy, you can put them here. And I'll be checking those and we'll bring them up. And we've also got some that have been emailed in and that they're already there to ask. So we'll probably mix it up a little bit. And I've got lots of questions to ask, but I'll try to be restrained and hope that we can hear from Wendy and Cornell. I'd like to acknowledge that Revis is not able to be with us today. He's been called away on police business. It is his job. And so we're very grateful um, that he'd had offered his time and we know that you'll um, bring his spirit through all the things that you say, Wendy, and yes. spending time with him. Yep. 
So I guess I'd like to start just by asking you both to tell us a bit about yourselves and then we'll get on with um, the film and the Q&A afterwards. But yeah, just I suppose to hear a bit about who are you and, and shall we make uh, Brother Cornell go first and get him to I warm so. us up? <laughs> <laughs> Over to you, Cornell. All right, so um, I'm a saltwater man from uh, Broome. Uh, come from uh, the Julian, Yaru and Guniandi tribes. Um, born and raised on the West Coast, uh, lived most of my life there. Um, just recently moved over to Sydney to, you know, further my studies in cinematography at uh, the film school and uh, been in Sydney ever since in um, 2011. Um, I'm mainly um, a documentary filmmaker, but I have dabbled in uh, short drama, feature films and um, live TV broadcasts, um, even sporting, filming the NRL and the AFL. So that's pretty much me. Great, pretty, yeah, diverse background and um, all kinds of camera skills that you bring. Yeah. And what about you, Wendy? Can you tell us a bit about yourself? Yeah, I'm a Noongar woman from, and I was born down south of Western, uh, Western Australia, a place called Bunbury. Um, but I stayed in the hospital for quite a long time and then I was fostered out in a, in a non-Indigenous family, grew up in Perth. Um, I have two foster brothers who joined the police years and years and years ago. Anyway, and I sort of followed their footsteps. Um, most of my policing um, has been in the country, in small communities. Um, and I've, I've just completed last year was, uh, 20 years, um, in the police service. So yeah, I'm quite proud of that fact. Um, but yeah, it's, um, it's been, it's been a wonderful journey really. And working in these small communities has just like enlightened me, um, probably up to this point where I am now. So, yeah. Yeah. And so we heard at the, toward the end of our law that you had uh, taken work in Kalgoorlie. Can we ask a bit about that and how's, how's that been going shifting? Or more yeah, no, it's, it was, it was good. Um, and then once I started work here, of course this virus happened. So I wasn't able to do what I was going to do, which was the induction packages and um, the, the reconciliation action plan with all the other officers. However, those that I have met, I've over the time that I've been here, I sort of give it a plug anyway. Um, and send emails out and that sort of thing. So, and I've done, I've done a lot of the written, I was reminded last night that I've actually done the written um, induction packages for all the stations anyway. So that's something that they can um, have as a guide at their, at their station. So, yeah, so it's, um, but yeah, so a lot of the work here in Kalgoorlie, unfortunately, has been, just to make sure people social distance, um, you know, the local people and making sure that everybody's okay and the kids are all right and all that sort of stuff. So it's been good. Yeah. Yeah, it's a major change, isn't it? And um, mm. education of police is, you know, no different. That has to change as well. Yeah. Yes. So, yes. So you mentioned some family history of policing, and I know Cornell as well. And Cornell, is that part of how you came to be involved in making our law? And could you give us a bit of an overview of our law, too? So yeah, I do have a lot of family members who are police officers. Uh, my younger brother is currently serving in the WA police force. Um, my stepmother was in the force for almost 20 years. Um, uh, grandfathers, uncles, um, a couple of cousins who are currently serving as well. So I have a lot of police members, you know, that served in the WA police force in, in the family. 
Um, I heard about the documentary through um, our producer, Taryn Lafar, who happens to be my big cousin. Um, she approached me with this story um, that she heard about, whispers about, and um, she did more research. She reached out to WA Police Force and Wendy and Revis, and um, we decided to try to make connections and, you know, conversations via phone, email. Um, uh, Wendy and Revis have met Taryn a few times with um, the other producer, Sam, in Perth. And um, we kind of went from there. Um, we, we had um, consultations with the community. So we went out um, to meet with, um, you know, elders, um, key, key people within the community to find out what kind of story they wanted to tell. As, as well as um, Wendy and Revis' story. So we wanted to see what engagement the community had with Wendy and Revis, as well as Wendy's and Revis' um, engagement with the community. And we wanted to tell that story um, as balanced as we could. So, um, you know, it was sitting around having a cup of tea and biscuits and stuff with um, all, all the various um, elders of um, the community. Um, well before any cameras came out. So it wasn't until three months later, we actually went out and started to film. Yeah. So you'd been in among community and getting comfortable finding your way around. Yeah. And did you already know Wendy and Revis or? No, um, I, this is um, my first encounter with both, but Wendy and Revis know my, my, my stepmom who served in the police force. So they, they've seen her around the traps <laughs> um, and uh, familiar. And I actually have a couple of family members who uh, Revis taught when he was in Geraldton. Um, or oh, didn't teach, but he was a part of a youth engagement in Geraldton. And they remember his face from, from, from then. Um, yeah, so for me, I was sort of, um, I was approached to do the directing and then it was all that first initial meeting was when we went out to uh, Warakuna and, you know, got to sit down and meet meet the people in Warakuna. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And Wendy, 20 years, I mean, it's just, yeah, such a long time. And uh, we heard about your story, obviously, in our law and looking back to, would you have ever thought that you would have 20 year history in the police force? And never, how do you kind of make never. sense of that? Uh, I, I would never have imagined it, but I just sort of, I think my motivation is to never forget where I've been and never forget where I've come from. That's my motivation to to keep continuing to do what I do. And if I can help others, then in the process, it's just a bonus. Yeah, absolutely. It really is. And we saw lots of ways that you helped in the community. I heard and saw referrals, uh, the health service, the school, the community. Yeah. And so if it works, there in Warakuna, and I'm sure you've seen elements of this type of community um, located policing and those partnerships work in other places. How can we try to you know, get this happening in other areas? It is through education, like educating the police on how to, you know, and it's, I, I don't want people to get the wrong idea where we're not, you know, we still lock people up. If, if they're misbehaving, we still lock them up. However, because of our engagement and because of that respect from both sides, it's not as traumatic for them when we have to say, look, you need to come with us and we'll deal with this. Um, you know, they accept the fact, that, okay, that there's been a problem that they need to sort out and they're quite happy to come with us. So that's what I'm hoping is that through educating the police on just small things like community engagement, like um, just talking to people all the time, you know, getting out of your vehicle and just 
walking around and just saying hello, you know, to people. Stop and have a chat. Sit down with the kids on the ground if you have to, you know, that sort of thing. So, but education, definitely. How do you find that police um, respond to you, you know, when you suggest those ways of being? And, and is Look, it... Yeah. I've I've actually received an email this morning from a couple of police officers who've said, you know, that they've seen our law and they're trying it in their communities now and it's and that's what I want. That's that's the whole point of this is to hopefully get that message across. And I responded this morning to one fella to a community that I've been backwards and forwards to. Um and I know this officer um, and just sort of giving him a few more tips and look, he's, he's all for it. You know, this, this style, I guess, of, of policing and look, I'm just hoping that it, it, it goes nationally and somehow internationally, because I think that there's a real message there that communication and engagement is a key to policing. Yeah. yeah. We saw you um, learn language and put a lot of effort in. Like, how hard was that and how realistic is that for other police to do as part of that uh, engagement? It, it, it is very hard um, because the words are just, wow. It's, but, you know, we had a book and then we're trying to, you, we're going back to basics, breaking down the, the words. <laughs> um, and then just, yeah, we did have a, a lady who was teaching us as well, who was non-Indigenous, and she spoke it fluent. Um, so, yeah, just trying. And I just think that if others can try to pick up some words, and you don't have to pick up everything. I mean, I couldn't put a sentence together to save my life. However, I know words, and I know keywords, see? So I listen, and then... I can work out what people are saying. So that's all people have to do is just learn some basics. And then as you, as you progress in your communities, it's more and more that you will learn, that you will pick up more and more, I believe. So yeah, but use it. Yeah, it sounds, because learning language, I mean, it just sounds like, you know, we're, we're back at, you know, school and it's French yes. and it's, um, it's yes. completely alien. And yes. I do have a question from one of our um, participants and they said they loved hearing you both reflect on working cross-culturally with Rorokuna community, learning language, learning how things are done in the community. How much did you draw on your previous experience? working as Indigenous police officers, but to engage in this way? And did you draw on your own Noongar ways of doing and ways of knowing and even a bit of language in working with Warakuna community? No, I, I personally don't have any, any links, I guess, to Noongar language or possibly nothing Noongar. <laughs> um, I learnt when I was stationed at Waluna, I was stationed there all up because I'd been there five and a half years, gone away, come back for another three and a half years. So all up five years and uh, nine years. So they taught me a lot of language there and I picked up a lot of language there. So that's where I used my knowledge of, because some of those words are quite similar to Warakuna to the Nanandara language. Um, so, yeah, so that's where I drew my experience from and just experience from working in Aboriginal community, really. That's, yeah, it's all, it's all tied in together. So it makes it, I guess, that in that sense, sound like anyone, you know. I mean, you obviously bring so much from your own experience and, and the long-term work you've done but anyone who doesn't speak that language was essentially where you were as well. Absolutely, absolutely. And it's, you know, we, we were learning from a book. So like you said, you know, we go back to the basics of, of learning. Um, anybody can, anybody can. Yeah, 
yeah, it's just, um, yeah, incredibly encouraging. And, and of course, we are all in this country, aren't we, and of this country. And uh, there are many languages that are available now for us to start to, to learn elements of. Yeah, yes. definitely. Well, I've got a couple of other questions to ask. So um, shall I ask this one? And how important is it to recruit more Indigenous police officers? And how can we do this? Well, we've got a, um, a cadetship at the police academy now, an Aboriginal uh, police cadetship. So we've got some young people there, Aboriginal people who have joined and are doing really, really well. Uh, we actually have a young cadet here in um, Kalgoorlie who is absolutely gorgeous and he's just learning stuff that we are um, teaching him, but also too is he goes out with the, uh, with the general uh, duties guys. Um, but yeah, he's so, and I think promoting in schools is a, is a big thing. Um, but also just getting out there and just talking to, to some of the youth. Um, I'm leaving Kalgoorlie within the next month or so to go to Geraldton because I'm going to be doing youth policing over there. So that's my big thing too, is to hopefully get some of the young ones over there to possibly think about maybe joining because a lot of people I know I was thought when I was that age thought I could never be a police officer or anything, you know, um, one, because I didn't know how, but also too, and I didn't know where to go for it, even though my brothers were there, but, you know, I didn't want to bother them. But yeah, so that's what I'm hoping is that some of the young ones will um, want to put their hands up and um, hopefully I can guide them. Yeah, well, I think you're, yeah, certainly an awesome role model, maybe walking ad for, for policing and um, yeah. And so what challenges do you think there are that Aboriginal community might have that would stop, um, you know, more young people entering the police force? There's a lot of influences, outside influences, um, but family is a big one where they might feel shame of joining police, you know, but also too is that they think that they might not be able to join because auntie or uncle have have had a record, they've been to prison or whatever, you know? So they might feel that shame. So for me, it would be my role to say, no, 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 you're not in trouble. You've never been in trouble. So, you know, there's no reasons why you can't join up. So that sort of thing. So that's, that's going to be my approach, I think, is just to, to give them the rundown of what the job's all about, but also how they can... You know, and not to let these influences, um, outside influences, run run your life really, because sometimes it does. Yeah, same. And I think we we equally hear that maybe the police force culture is very influential as well. Say when Indigenous people enter that, and yes. how have you managed to you know sustain such a long career within the police? I just think for me, it's like everything that knocks me down makes me stronger, really. So I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to give in to, I'm not going to give in to, um, you know, the abuse from both sides, you know. Um, local people, you know, they'll have a go at me too. But, you know, it's like, I'm not giving in to you. <laughs> So it just makes me stronger, any little thing. Yeah, definitely. And what about the role of non-Indigenous police in, like, supporting you over the years? And have you felt that support? And, and what is their role going forward, especially about, as you say, that education, the respect and the communication that your I'm, ways have? I've been very lucky. I've been very lucky with... Um, you know, with the non-Indigenous police is, uh, in, in Waluna when I was based there, I had one of the best sergeants ever who was 
non-Indigenous. He's taught me everything. I actually spoke to him the other day and I told him that all this is all his fault because he taught me too well. So it's, you know, the support I got from him, the learning I got from the guys that I worked with in Maluna was just amazing. Um, Because I was a liaison officer when I first went to Maluna. And over the years, I was doing everything that they were all doing anyway. So when the time came for to do the transition to police, I put my hand up straight away and I said, yes, yes. So, and I got all the support through all of that. Um, My superintendent now is, I've known him for years and he is just so very, very supportive of myself um, and just will always be that support for me if I need it, you know, and I have other officers that are, that have, just shown me that support um, through throughout my career, my brothers as well. You know, they've all been there for me. So it's it's been really, really good. Mm, yeah. Yeah. So it's a mix of what you bring and your, you know, get knocked down. It makes you stronger as well as having that support from other people. Yeah, yeah it is vital, isn't it? And yeah. Mm. Um, yeah, it's awesome to hear about. And um, Cornell, we got a question from uh, one of the participants about your experience in the police force, um, like growing up in Broome before living in Sydney. And, so yeah. growing up in Broome, it, it was mixed. In, in the early years, there was a lot of engagement with uh, police in the community. And then through my teenage years, that's when it's sort of like, um, I guess a new guard came through to Broome and that's when I started seeing, you know, sort of racial profiling, like we'd get harassed on the way home from say the cinema to going home. And you know, like, if we're out and about, we must be up to something kind of stuff. Um, but then um, uh, later on, I was a part of a program called Hype, which was help young people engage, which means um, you had the Shire Broom, uh, the police, and DCP all working together to um, engage the kids that are out on Friday nights and Saturday nights causing trouble and going like, hey, look, there's there's a three-point shootout competition down at the PCYC over here. There's a disco over here. These are things you can go to instead of being on the street. So I've had a very mixed relationship with, with police in general. So I've had, like I said, there's there's great police officers out there, but there's a, there's a few that just taint the institution for me um last year um prime example um walking to work to sydney uni on my way um in my own neighborhood being cornered by three officers um um saying that i fit the description of a particular indigenous person and i said look what what's the description they didn't tell me um um, I said, well, what, what's the name of the guy you're looking for? And obviously it wasn't me. I said, well, here's my ID to prove I'm not the person you're looking for. And um, clearly I should have been let, you know, let go because, you know, I had done nothing wrong and I'm not the person they're looking for. But I was detained for another half an hour so that they could do uh, background checks on me to see if I have any outstanding warrants, you know. So it's like... Um, I'm in a predominantly white neighborhood, the only black guy, it must be me, you know. Um, so it's things like that just make me not trust the institution. I mean, I, I, there's a lot of great officers. I mean, like I said, my family members are all officers, you know, and people go, well, how come you don't trust the police? You've got family members um, that are officers. And I said, well, it's not that, it's still, um, I guess the institutionalized racism, systemic racism that's there from, you know, policies dating historically back. And, you know, that's, that's it. But that's the whole reason I did this documentary was to show a success story and a pathway to restore trust in police and, and, and bridge that gap between indigenous community and police officers. Um, and, you know, what Wendy and Revis are doing is it's 
if you really look at it, it's very simple. You know, it's, it's um, things that every human being should do. <laughs> you know, respect, <laughs> key, key, key um, element in why it's a lot of success is happening in Warakuna. Um, understanding of cultural differences. So, you know, people forget I'm Aboriginal. They think I know everything about Aboriginal culture. I'm no authority on anything Aboriginal because we're individual countries. And so, you, you know, you go into another land, you have to learn that culture, that the protocols, that language. Um, so it's not just a matter of going, oh yeah, I'm going to go over here and everything's going to be fine because I'm black. That's not right. <laughs> you, you've got to learn those um, cultural differences. So that's, that's another thing that Wendy and Rivers is doing really well is understanding the cultural differences out there and working with it. Um, another thing is um, communication. And that's why I tried to focus a lot on language in the doco and show how important language, learning the language is in terms of communicating. Um, English is like a second or third language out there in Warakuna, you know. Um, um, so, you know, there could be communication breakdowns when, you know, you do go out on a call or something and because of language barrier. And uh, what I see with Wendy and Revis is they're, they're attempting to find a toolkit so that they can diffuse situations, which would normally lead to anger, frustration, and sometimes arrest because of that miscommunication. But seeing them being able to be in community and have casual conversations and there's no tension. I think that's, that's the problem. When there's tension, things get escalated. And they, they have this, this wonderful ability to just, you know, calm situations down and, and um, do it in a respectful way. And then uh, when he touched on it as well, education. I think um, education plays a, a big part in, in change, in any change, anywhere, any industry, any, um, you know, job. You've got to educate yourself in the history, the, the, the politics and stuff to understand somebody else. So officers might go out on a call and don't understand why indigenous people are angry towards them. You know, they're not personally angry towards the officers that are coming on the call. It's the institution that they represent because a lot of um, policies that were enforced by police officers were, you know, traumatic. I mean, stolen generation, you know, removal of kids, it's, you know, also death in custody. So there's a lot of anger within the indigenous community towards the institution. And so when, if police officers understand those historical contests and those political contexts, then they might be able to go, okay, they're not really angry at me. They're angry at the badge. What can I do to diffuse the situation? And, you know, language in some cases helps diffuse those situations. And yeah, that's, that's why I wanted to make the doco. <laughs> We've had a question come through about that um, advice that you'd give to young trainee officers on um, how to deal with, I guess, those really difficult situations. And I just wanted to connect that, obviously, to, you know, images that are probably imprinted on many of our minds of uh, police officer local to me caught on film being you know, very abusive and how shocking that was. And I guess the sense that people felt that other skills might have been able to be drawn on instead. And what was it like for you? So stitching those couple of things together, having this film come out right at a time when we saw arguably the opposite to what uh, the message is that you're trying to convey. For me, um, I I just feel that, like was mentioned before with the education, now some of these younger police officers, I think it goes back to what Cornell was saying in regards to they need to understand that there's a past there. 
yes, it's in the past and hopefully we can leave it in the past, but they have to be mindful of it's happened. So the older people aren't going to trust that badge and it's been filtered down amongst the generations. So our role now is to say, hey, yes, we, the new officers need to understand that, yes, but just go beyond, look beyond what the problem is at the time, if that makes sense. I, I was reading up on a thing called lateral violence where it's um, like there's somebody, there's a fellow going off, okay, so let's go and deal with that matter. But what's happening to him right there is a lead up to, as to what's happened during the week or whatever. He could have been, the way I perceive it is that he could have gone for 10 jobs during the week and got knocked back every time. So now his frustration is at a boiling point. So this is where police need to understand that concept as well to say, okay, and just talk through what the problem is. Okay. It could have happened. And, and a lot of our, some of our jobs that we, we do attend have stemmed from something that happened two days ago, but we weren't called. So we've got to understand that fact that, okay, so this has happened two, two days ago. Um, we don't dwell on the fact that, no, you didn't call us. We're here now, so let's deal with it. That sort of thing. And I think that that's how, and if I can teach some of the younger ones that sort of system, I'd be very happy because I think that's, that works as well. Yeah, yeah, definitely, absolutely. Uh, what have the community thought about... Well, seeing the doco come out, how how receptive were they to having the documentary? But then, what's it been like coming out right now when police brutality has been in the media more than ever? So, Warakuna community, you mean? They've actually got a big screening tomorrow because some people were away. So, the whole community is going to be set up with a big screen and they're going to be playing it tomorrow. So yeah, it'll be, it'll be interesting. What about you, Cornell? Um, you've done lots of media and I know that you said, interestingly, some of it uh, has come from the East Coast. Why do you think there's been so much interest given that this is a remote WA Aboriginal community? I think, you know, in the current climate with um, what's happening overseas um, and what's happening here in Australia, um, you know, there's a lot of talk about the problems that are happening. And this is uh, presenting a possible solution. There's not, there's not much people talking about what kind of um, solutions are there. And, you know, there's great, a lot of great community um, programs that are happening around Australia that we just don't hear about. I mean, there's one here in Sydney, Clean Slate Without Prejudice. I think uh, the Tribal Warrior um, uh, run that here in uh, Sydney. And that's, you know, engaging uh, prisoners and uh, officers and Redfern community. And, you know, you, you don't hear much about those programs and, you know, what's happening in Warakuna. And so, when you're presented with a, a doco like this, it you know it's a conversation starter because people are looking at the problem, go well, how do we fix it? How do we, you know, do that? And I, it you know it's quite timely that this doco has come out because it's showing a potential pathway. And um, my hope is is that um, you know people watch it and go well, that that's an amazing thing that's happening over there. Why why isn't it happening? And hopefully they go back to their community and go, well, is there any programs like this? Um, or, you know, um, if not, what can we do to make it happen here? And so that's that's my hope for the doco is, um, you know, that it's hopefully that spark to get engagement with um, community and policing and, you know, trying to find solutions to the problem instead of just, you know, the media is just constantly focused on the, the, the the negative side of things and 
Yeah, um, I mean, when we did this doco, you know, we, we finished filming last year. So it was well before what's happening now. And, um, but I mean, at the time, Miss, Miss Clark got shot in Geraldton. And I think it was only two days into filming. Um, and so, you know, that was like a, a moment that cemented how important the doco was, was to go, look, we need to show success stories. We need to show possible pathways. Um, you know, there are answers, but people have to seek and engage with it. Yeah, there's, there have been great uh, reports in media too about, you know, being a good ally for Aboriginal people and 10 steps you can take to learn more about Aboriginal Australia. And we have had a question emailed in with someone saying that they feel that the, they've learned the most when they've visited uh, Aboriginal communities or worked together with Indigenous peoples that clean slate without prejudice that tribal warrior run is an example where anyone can show up to boxing most mornings a week. But um, yeah, I suppose that the question's just asking about that. Um, are, are Indigenous communities happy to have non-Indigenous people visiting and asking questions about how to work together? Wendy, what do you think for remote I... WA because it's quite different to Redfern? I, I think that the, the communities do want that help because what's happened in the past is that a lot of um, non-Indigenous people are going to these communities with their ideas and rah, rah, rah. So that's great. Not even consulting the community and saying, this is what the community needs and this is what they want. Well, no, they don't. Ask them first. You know, it's like, that's what people gets people's backs up. And I probably be the same is like, oh, hang on a minute. You haven't asked us what we need. Um, so that's where I see, but on the whole, if people are going to go there, not indigenous, that's great. But work with that community, go and it's like policing, go and find out who your key stakeholders are, your elders, all those, and make sure that they are consultation with them those people initial contact, you know, because, and that will, that will, you know, that's about a quarter of your, your, um, your not problem, but you know what I mean? It's like, that's how things start really. And it's just by consultation. Damn. Yeah, well, our role, I suppose, with the National Centre for Cultural Competence is working with university staff and there's modules available, some of which um, Cornell's had a major role in developing. And there's a question from a participant about what can universities do to play a role in changing and improving relationships, do you think, between Indigenous and non-Indigenous communities? I might ask Wendy, um, that, and, um, but great to hear from you as well on that one, Cornell. Yeah, what do you think, Wendy? Um, I, I just think that there needs to be um, specific guidelines in the sense that um, with the police, say like me, with doing the induction packages for each of the police stations, that is, a, to me, is a guide for them when they're out in these communities, how to... How to um, how to behave in these communities, um, respect their protocols and different things like that. But you need they need to learn all that as well. So I just think that there needs to be with universities as well, perhaps. And if I can just mention that I did the first induction package at a station that I was at called Megathera. What we ended up doing was that when new nurses came to town, new doctors, new teachers, we actually delivered that same message to those as well. That was specifically for police, but we were able to deliver it to these other agencies as well, which worked. So I, that, and that's how I think, how I think that it will be um, a success is by 
doing up some induction packages, um, like I say, just as a, as a guide really to help people along who are involved in these institutions. Yeah. Yeah, it's great to hear. And I'm, I'm just astounded you've named, yeah, several communities um, so far. And yeah, that's awesome. We did, we have had a question about like, what, what has the interest or support been, you know, well, on a national level, but um, I suppose policing being state-based, yeah, on, uh, across any other states, have you had any interest in um, that better induction uh and... No, and that's what I'm hoping for. <laughs> I, th I, think it, uh -huh. I think it would be wonderful. I think it would be, and, and to be honest, I think, I think Revis and I would possibly be quite, um, you know, a good advocate for it um, because it's worked where we've been. You know what I mean? It's, um, and I'd love to do it. I'd love to do it, it anywhere, wherever. <laughs> Because yeah, I, that, there's that just that one message, you know, that is trying to, like I said, break down these barriers. So yeah, and I'd I'd be into that. Yeah, definitely. Well, uh, like I said before, we have um, modules, training modules, and we got given some amazing data about the success of those this morning. And Cornell, I know you were on the receiving end of. Um, absolutely fantastic feedback. So what do you make of the role of universities, those modules? How can we broaden out um, with that vision that Wendy's got of the role her and Revis could have? Well, I think um, here at Sydney Uni, we're, we're, we're going in the right direction in terms of um, uh, giving students graduate quality, uh, um, a graduate quality of cultural competence and um, I think if we can influence those here at the university before they go out into the wider world and they work in organizations where some of them might be areas of predominantly indigenous people, if they have a toolkit to draw upon, um, like when he's saying in, you know, induction packages or, you know, the, the cultural competence modules that we have here at the university, um, I think or have a better chance of engaging with, you know, other cultures, you know, not, not only the indigenous culture, but also other cultures in general. I mean, mm. that's the beauty of the, the, the cultural competence modules. You can apply it to not just indigenous people, you can apply it to anybody. I mean, we, we will have, you know, possibly doctors, lawyers and stuff that are going to be working over in India or, you know, over in South America. So um, hopefully, uh, the center is able to embed, you know, what we what we're trying to do here across the university, and the students leave with that that ability and that confidence to be able to handle them, their themselves in a, a multicultural environment. And like I said, communication plays a big role in any interaction. So, if you have you know, the cool toolkits to communicate with people of different cultures by understanding where your, your place and your relativeness to the other person. I mean, in Aboriginal culture, that's the first thing we do. We're like, when you meet someone, it's like, who's your mob, where you're from? So we always are looking for connections so that we can, we know where we stand and how we relate to that person and how we approach that person and what kind of respect we show them. And so, yeah, it's all about your relationship or your relation to connection to the other person, how you s sit, which also shows how, what kind of respect or how to show respect to that person. You know, um, if you're on someone else's land, you know, you've got to understand, you know, the protocols that come with that, you know. Um, but universities should play a major role because it's education. <laughs> I mm. mean, that's the key to any change in society is understanding um, the context of situations. And in order for you to do that, you have to have um, be educated in the history, you know, the politics that were involved in it. Um, and, you know, 
it starts in high school, it starts in primary school. I mean, we have to start looking, Australia has to have, uh, you know, a real good look at stuff and have truth telling. I mean, just the changing of one word changes the way you perceive things. So for example, discovered, invaded, you know, if those two things change the whole way you see Australia, you know, if you see that it was, you know, it was discovered, then everything's mm. peachy. But if you see, um, say it's invaded, then you go, okay, well, there's got to be some trauma there. There's got to be something that some sort of displacement or, and then you can start to see, um, you know, the anger, the frustration and the issues that have stemmed from that sort of um, beginning, I guess. Um, you can't have a real conversation without having two sides, you knowing both sides. So otherwise you have, you know, leaders in our country that say we've never had slavery, you know, that's just an uneducated, you know. Yeah. What a, a massive time it's been for the film to be at Sydney Film Festival with uh, just so much going on. Yeah. So it must have been a really intense time. And um, we've only got 10 minutes left with you. And we've actually got about five more questions. So I'm just going to dance around to a few random things. Are there more documentaries in the pipeline? Uh, in terms of um, the Our Law series? Uh, uh, I think it's just a general question. You can give us any hints into your next blockbuster or <laughs> um, episodes. Um, um, uh, Taryn is Taryn and Sam are looking at developing more episodes for the Our Law series. So um, we um, going to follow Wendy and Travis, but we're also going to have a look at other programs that are happening in WA. Uh, it might actually be national as well, so we might see what other states have, but we we haven't gone that far yet. But it's um, we're in the development phase of creating more episodes to the series. Um, oh, that's great because that answers two other questions. Yeah, what <laughs> interest has there been in um, from neighbouring communities, police stations um, and Indigenous communities? Warburton, Blackstone have been mentioned. And also um, Perth, what's your experience, you know, working in Perth as well? And so will we be travelling across WA? with uh, these episodes? Well, we hope so. I mean, Wendy's now in Geraldton in a new role, so we'll possibly follow that and see where she is with that. Um, uh, yeah, it's, when, you, when we were making this, we had a half hour time slot to fill on NITV. And so obviously there's a lot of um, uh, great stuff that we had to cut from the film to fit in the half hour. So there's still a lot of stuff that we didn't touch on that we're going to try and expand on. Well, interestingly, we do have a question about that as well. So can you give us a couple of little insights in the brief time? Like, like what? Like what? Okay. So um, one of the things we might explore would be probably, you know, the academy and how the academy is approaching it. And uh, hopefully, um, up since our law has been out, there might be some sort of changes happening in the academy, if not explore why it hasn't happened. Um, you know, also <coughs> just seeing what kind of policies are uh, being drafted and, you know, what kind of changes are in the pipeline but haven't been put out there yet. Because um, there's a lot of WA police force is actively trying to um, uh, mend that broken relationship. You know, I mean, when we were filming for the first time in the history of WA police force, the <laughs> plague was raised up in uh, at the headquarters. And around that time as well, um, the commissioner, WA commissioner, uh, gave an apology for their involvement in any of the policies that they had to enforce in WA. So, you know, you know, um, one of them would be uh, dog tags. Um, we had dog tags, which were a certificate that said, you know, at a particular time in the day, there was a boundary. If you were 
on that side, you weren't allowed to be there unless you had a dog tag. And of course, the police force had to enforce that. And so they put their hand up and said, look, we understand we had a role in enforcing these racist policies. So they're doing a lot of stuff like that, but we want to explore where they're going to go f with it. So that's the kind of it. So we're, we're oh, still so doing the research. Yeah. Plenty there. Uh, we'd be happy to host another discussion. And um, I better do the dutiful thing and begin to wind up. But um, uh, we've got another kind of deep question for you, Wendy, that I think could um, be lovely to hear from you about. And that's your experience um, in the way non-Indigenous people have engaged with you as a Indigenous police officer. And yeah, I suppose what's that been like? And, and then I guess we'll be ending about there. So yeah, just a bit more on your vision for yourself for the future that we can, you know, know that we're behind you. My experience with non-Indigenous people has been wonderful. It's wherever I go, I always introduce myself. Um, and, you know, it's not forcing myself on people. It's like just introducing myself. They can take me, take me or leave me, whatever. But, uh, yeah, I've, I've, always, I've always maintained that I treat people the, the same, you know. It's, it's, there's no different. We're all human. Do you know what I mean? So, to me... Someone of another colour, well, who cares? They, if they talk nice to me, I talk nice to them. You know, if you're going to play up, then I'm going to deal with you one way or the other, you know. And it's, um, I, I don't, I, I, I've got a lot of non-Indigenous friends over the years through these communities that I've, work, I've worked in. Um, and it's, it's just wonderful. It really is. And they're still my friends. You know, once I leave communities, they're still my friends. So we had to start somewhere and it was like I said, just me going in and introducing myself and wherever I am. And I'll be doing the same in Geraldton is like introduce myself, go through, like walk through. I've done it before, like walk through the shops and say day and make sure everybody's okay. Because like I said, I'm a police officer. That's, that's my role. So I've got to protect everybody as well, you know, so I can't pick and choose who I protect. Um, and I, and no way would I, would I choose who I protect? You know what I mean? It's like I serve everybody. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, on that note, we just really offer our love and protection for you, Wendy, on your ongoing journey. And we really look forward to, well, more episodes, but hearing through the grapevine, through Cornell, through the NCCC. Um, how it's all going for you and may you be well good self-care and yeah deep gratitude for all of the effort that you make and the uh, encouragement that you give for us to be close to each other cross-culturally and overcome those challenges yeah so thank you so much well thank you for the opportunity to be able to get this message out there i appreciate it Well, it's 3 p.m. That brings us to the end of our session. I'm just beaming with yeah, pride and um, honour at that rare opportunity to talk about these issues, to have so many people listening along and supporting this event. Really grateful for that as well. Thank you, Cornell, for uh, your time and thank you, Wendy, for your time and effort today. You are welcome. So, there's nothing else. I shall bring our gathering to a close. May you all be well. <laughs>